And it's very important to know that, um, that life is finite and it comes to an end, you know. And how do we prepare ourselves? It's the perception that you're not afraid of even dying. It's part of living. The time to be born and time to die, I think we accept that. You know? When a patient, you tell them that, this, that you have cancer, there's, it's not this thing about anger, you know. It's more of shock and then fear. Because sometimes they get angry at the doctors, you know. I think in the last phase of life, when there's pain, don't be afraid to ask for morphine. And, and very important, select the right doctor to look after you. And don't be forced to look up this doctor because he's so famous. No, no. Look at a doctor that you have a good rapport with, a kind person who talk to you. So even in a walk round, I, I tell my students, don't say, oh, bed 37, a pace of cancer of the stomach. No, page 37 is a person, it's Tan Ah Kao, he's got a name, he's got a family. And sometimes when we're young doctors, people will say, oh, page 37, cancer of the stomach, there's nothing you can do. You just say hello and then they move on. And no, you just also spend time talking to this person with cancer. He has a few more days to live, have a chat with him, ask him, learn from him also. He'll be delighted, he's so lonely. Sometimes you find that the, the, the patient's relatives may not come to see him. So do not skip the bits and spend some time with them. This lady was working for a big multinational company. And she was about 45 years old, diagnosed with cancer of the breast. And I was seen by the oncologist and um, the oncologist wrote me a note, I think you should see this patient because I cannot cope with her anger. She was very, very angry. So she came down to see me in my clinic. She told me that um, she has got a wonderful job, you know, um, and she has two young kids. And she told me that, I wonder why God got to punish me in this way, you know. I'm doing very well in my career, my kids are growing well, and now I have told I have cancer, you know, on the breast, you know. She said, God has been a bit cruel to me, you know. She told me that I don't mind having the pain of the cancer treatment and everything, you know. Um, but the pain of thinking that you're leaving behind your two children is so painful to me. And she quoted a line, uh, she mentioned a line, the pain of the mind is worse than the pain of the body. They can take any kind of pain. The, the cancer can eat up my rib cage. That kind of pain, I can take it, you know. But the thing that you're going to leave behind, two young kids, you know, is so painful to me. But then we went on into psychological therapy and also to help her to rest well, teach her some other techniques of relaxation, uh, some form of mindfulness also. So eventually her depression lifted, you know, and in fact, the cancer treatment was improving. Before I discharged her, she told me, I was so embarrassed and ashamed of myself, you know. How could I be angry with God, you know? At the time when she was having cancer treatment, friends came down and they helped to build up the family relationship, you know. And people, she thought, never cared about her, really cared for her, you know. And also, they were looking after the children for her when she was going to cancer treatment. So we have a lot of misconceptions, a lot of fears we have, you know. And this fear is often translated into other kind of things in our mind. And in this case, even angry with God, the wife of a pastor getting angry with God, you know, and, and uh, I'm, I'm sure she'll be remorseful uh, things. And so it turned out well. And I, I told her, I'll borrow this line for my next uh, article, in, I wrote an editorial in the Singapore Medical Journal. The pain of the mind is worse than the pain of the body. I see quite a number of elderly people with, with dementia, of, of memory problems. So once they have this illness, you know, the fear comes that I'm going to die. You know. It's a terminal illness. So it's, it's very important to dispel this misconception. So I tell them that dementia is a chronic illness. But because of our research, in which we published probably the first paper in the world on the natural history of dementia, that dementia has about three phases, mild, moderate, and severe. And we tell the person, you have about 10 to 12 years more in your life. So it's important whenever I talk to this kind of uh, issues to patients, to give them a sense of hope that you have about 12 years, there are many things you can do. How can we improve the quality of life?
At the same time, you prepare the family members. Because a, a diagnosis like dementia is a very frightening illness, the frightening diagnosis. And therefore, they ask themselves, is this the end of life? Is he going to die soon? I think the approach is also, it's not to give them all the time the bad news. They probably come to see you um, as a specialist, as the last spot of call. At one time, we were the World Health Centre for Dementia Research. I have one who came down from Kuala Lumpur, KL. This lady is a lawyer and she brought the mother down to see me. And um, she wanted me to confirm that this, the mother has dementia of the Alzheimer's type. So we examined her, the brain imaging studies, uh, testing, and I, towards the evening I told her, it's true, the, the, the doctors in KL uh, diagnosed correctly. This is a case of d- dementia of the Alzheimer's type. Then she became a bit sad and then even be, a bit angry, you know. So I asked her, what happened? So it means that my mother has given me this, this illness. I've heard that it's all genetics, that I will have dementia myself, you know. So this fear, you know, right? So I need to clarify with her. You know, it doesn't mean that uh, the mother has dementia. That means you have, will have dementia. It is not inherited as a dominant gene. So it mean, you may skip one generation, you know. You're quite a charming lady, and and I told her that you're also a bright lady. You know, you also have the genes for intelligence from your mother, and so sometimes they they forget about this all these points. But at the same time, as doctors, you must give them a sense of hope. You know, even for those who are dying, that even after death, life goes on for your family. There's a line from uh, a French author who won the Nobel Prize that where there is no hope. We must prescribe hope. I think that's very important, or else they'll get so angry, upset with things. I think we have to recognise that here in Singapore, there is still a stigma of mental illness. You know, um, so when I was the CEO of IMH, you know, even telling people that you're CEO of IMH struck fear in people. You know, embarrassment. Those days it was called Woodbridge Hospital. So I told myself, one of the first thing I must do is to rebrand the hospital as Institute of Mental Health. Institute meaning the teaching area, we research, all that. So introducing um, uh, psychiatry into integrated care for people, it's for seniors, for in the healthcare, or also in oncology is something that we, we have been discussing with our colleagues. But because there are not too many psychiatrists, the, the training of psychiatry is so long. The time I entered medical school, you will become a psychiatrist 13 years. It's a long, long time. So I told the, uh, the, the health authorities, bet, maybe better to train psychologists or social workers in some skills in uh, counselling to help them out. So in many centres now in Singapore, in the uh, health services for seniors, and also in oncology, they do have psychologists or counsellors or social workers to help out. So the big research we are doing here in Singapore is called Where There Is No Psychiatrist. So we're training retired teachers and various people to teach them some skills on counselling, psychological uh, therapy, so that when someone in the community has some mild symptoms, they can be seen by someone at that level and and they do some psychological first aid. This is very important because we know that although over the last 10, 20 years we're training more doctors, more nurses, more psychologists, more psychiatrists, but the suicide rate is still high, which means that we have not tackled it properly. In the hospital, attempted suicide of young people is still high. Something has gone wrong. I look after some university students, you know, and, uh, and one day I wrote a letter to the president and said, I'm just doing downstream work. The student is depressed and suicidal. Why don't we go upstream to find out what happened and prevent it? You know? uh, similarly for, for elderly, it's good to have more doctors and nurses open up more clinics. This is all downstream. You know, you know. What happened upstream? Why are old people who have done so much for Singapore, we have seen Singapore from third world to first world nation work so hard, now, at, the, at this autumn of their life, they are depressed and suicidal. Now, what are the issues? 
address the sociological issues that we have to tackle with. It's not just the medical issues. So these are important things that, in terms of integrating care, is, care is good, get them involved, but at a higher level, can we prevent it? There's a wonderful question and an uh, issue that we discussed in the Faculty of Medicine some 20 years ago. We told the uh, other professors that maybe it's time for us to, to even our training program, in the curriculum, to, to talk about death and dying, you know. Well, some doctors are a bit dismayed because they say we are here to save people's lives. we are talking about dying, you know. But then we say that we cannot save everybody, you know. And so how do we cope? Because sometimes the doctors themselves have to cope with this issue. You know. So the first part is to, in the curriculum, to have something on death and dying, you know, that we can talk about it. And it's beginning once again, the, the, the reception from the students wasn't that enthusiastic. You know, all right. uh, maybe it's to get the right, right person to, to, in the teaching process. You know. But towards the end, we realized the best time is when you're in the clinics with the students. Giving theory, tell them about Clover Ross's the five stages. They can pass MCQ question. What are the five stages? One, two, three, four, five. But then in the clinics, they find it's different. You know, the students will tell me, we just saw a patient with cancer, with a severe stage four cancer, and the patient was in a state of shock. And not, as we thought, would be anger. No, the patient was shocked. The patient was frightened. Fear, you know, which is not discussed in the Global Ross's five stages. So it's a bit, bit different, I think. So it's, it's best to teach in the bedside and tell them what to do and uh, what can be done. The young doctors often is that they're a bit dismayed. They don't want to talk about death because you, you go to medical school to be a doctor to save people's life, you know, to, to touch them and say, take up your bed and walk. Yes. And it's also very difficult for many years to get doctors to want to do oncology at one time, geriatric medicine. Everyone wants to become a heart surgeon. You can take out a heart, replace, earn a lot of money, kind of thing. But I'm glad things are changing. The curriculum changed. We broached them and talked about our own mortality. At one time, I was in charge of the admission of medical students to the Faculty of Medicine. And the students from the JCs were very smart. They know that, oh, Dr. Kwa is in charge, yeah. so they, they look at my research, oh, he does aging. So a group came from RI came, hey, Prof, um, can, can we do some research with you? I said, sure. So, so I said, what kind of research are you going to do? They talked about some basic science, cellular research. I said, no, just go back home to your friends and tell me, find out your friends, how many of them are, are living with their grandparents? Tell me their, how their perception is. We realise those who live with their grandparents have more positive attitude towards aging, and death and dying. But those who, who don't, and they, they only know about aging and death and dying from television, everything is so uh, um, bleak and all that. We don't want to do, if we become doctors, we don't want to do geriatric. If our parents grow old, we don't want them to stay with us. You know, There's a lot of negativity. You know. So similarly for the um, medical student, when we teach them, um, we want also to tell them that what we can do even though someone has a cancer with severe pain, you know, we can also give them some uh, painkillers to relieve the pain. And then the question raised about 20 years ago, you mean you want to give morphine to someone with cancer? I said, what do you mean? Anything wrong with that? You develop an addiction. I said, this person has probably about six months or a year to live. You are afraid of addiction. You want to relieve the pain. You know? What do you worry about addiction for? Morphine can be given. You know, because they are very well managed by us, we can give them. You know, not abuse. So that's a very important point for them to realise. And I often like to get someone who is more inspiring to teach them uh, death and dying or geriatrics. Now. Get somebody who, who the students will fall asleep, that kind of thing, to get them involved in the teaching of this subject. They will have to un understand about their own mortality and ask them uh, uh, what do you think runs to the mind of someone who is passing on. You know. So sometimes, understand the psychology of aging, uh, death and dying, then they become, they, they will accept this kind of a training program. It's very painful to any doctor to have a patient in your hand, die in your hand, even, even a surgeon, you know. You know uh, uh, surgeons or even a physician will have patients who die in our hands, you know. And how do we grapple with it? You know, 
So um, a few years ago, I had a patient who, who was a teacher, you know, and was referred to me with severe depression. Reluctantly, he came to my clinic, and it took us a long, long time. We were only depressed, he was suicidal, a school teacher. It took me about more than six months before he recovered. And after this charge, um, I was back home in Malaysia for a holiday, and I received a message from the wife that the husband the relapsed of depression and he jumped, killed himself. You know. Wow, that was a frightening thought. And somebody you know so well now, you I mean, know the family. So I came back and, and I, one of the first few uh, uh, cases that I attended the funeral of this person, you know, I know him so well, you know, a wonderful teacher. And then I was talking to the family. It seems that he was afraid because I was away to see a psychiatrist again. You know. So it's a stigma that it sometimes get on people, that they are frightened, that it, mental health profession means you're mad, a kind of dangerousness, you know. And she rather stay on his own. You know and no one to take care of him. Um, the family took care of him, but he refused to see a doctor. And then the depression was so severe that one day he decided to commit suicide, you know. So it, it dawned upon me, not only the stigma, but also um, discharging someone after six months will not be the right thing. He has other things to deal with uh, uh, that we have sometimes forget about, you know. That particular day, I, I decided to go for a walk. And I have to walk in the, the rainforest at Botanic Gardens and walk mindfully to the rainforest and, and process what happened, you know. Have, I, have we missed out something? Have I, should I have asked someone to take care of him in my absence? You wonder whether you have you missed out anything, you know, in, in the treatment itself. And uh, maybe the next case that comes, we shouldn't discharge someone too early, you know. And, and so these are thoughts that run throughout through my mind, you know. Um, and... And sometimes you, you talk to a friend and what do you think of this particular case? And so that's the, uh, the benefit of being in, in the, with a team. You ask our friend, hey, what, what would you do in this situation? You know, how can we prevent it? Most important, can we prevent it in the future? You know? And that we are not uh, infallible and that we, we can do mistakes. In the beginning, when the pandemic started, we, we, we knew very little about the COVID-19, and there's so much fear. I'm looking after quite a number of staff, nurses and doctors who are burnt out, who are the frontliners. They look after patients with fever and cough, and also very, very fearful. And I tell people there's not only a, the pandemic of the COVID-19, there's also a pandemic of fear. And I was asked to give talks to the, people, to the doctors in the, uh, uh, Asia, and I told them that, uh, wrongly, I told them that the pandemic, just like SARS, will finish off in a year. But it went on the second year, the third year. And can you imagine people working in the front line, day in and day out, and you have this fear, you go wear the PPE, you know, and it's so uncomfortable, it goes on. I know it personally because my daughter is a senior consultant in emergency medicine at Ku Teck Port and, and, uh, and uh, KK Hospital. And she told me, Dad, I feel like giving up, you know, and it's so tiring. But she's quite a good leader. She's trying to get the team together. And, and then now and then, their good friend, uh, the celebrity chef, Violet Un, who sent us some food. On my side, uh, uh, Tan Fei Xiong from the Malaysia Bole will send them food. And, and I, so it's, it's a sign of, uh, they feel happy about this sense of appreciation or gratitude. But how do they grapple with the, the sudden death? And this I'm often in, encountered by the people at intensive care. They see more, but also the frontliners have this kind of fear. And I realized that many of the, the, the doctors or the nurses I helped through uh, burnout phase often repress all this fear in their subconscious mind. They often come out in their, in their sleep, they complain of sleep problem, you know. So um, how to help them out? I think best is to give them a break. And also I do teach them some techniques or mindfulness practice to help them overcome it. MOH also mentioned well, from, from financial rewards for them, which I think is good to, and appreciation. But it's an issue that I think we, we never thought about it because it's so sudden, the pandemic, and people are just caught in it. I've been a teacher here from, from 82. 
which means they have almost 40 years. And, and beginning in 82, there's no such thing as talking about death and dying. There's only a geriatrician named Anne Merriman who asked me whether we could insert that into the curriculum. Oh, that was a, a difficult time to tell the dean of medicine we're going to insert another program. You know, they said the students are already inundated; they're complaining there's so much to read, and you're going to introduce something for them again. So that was something of relevant. What happened to the dean was someone who is quite on the ball and recognizes this kind of change will come about. Things that we're not talk about, you know. Maybe it's timely. So we, we introduce that as a lecture only. But I tell them that uh, it should be discussed more in the clinics and, or in the ward round. You know. So over the last uh, uh, 40 years now, the more discussion during the, the training in palliative medicine, which is very good, I think. And so I think that will brought up the, uh, the perspective of our young doctors who are coming out, who don't think that is, medicine is, is just curing, curative. Most young uh, students enter medicine uh, to, to cure and to treat and not to, to look after the dying patient. To them, it's a failure. If a patient dies in their hand, that's a failure. You know? So they must do everything. They don't want to talk about death. So they repress it within their subconscious mind. We don't want to talk about death. Over the years now, we realize that this is more common amongst younger doctors. The more senior doctors, you realize that you've seen through the last 20, 30 years that in some cases you, you do your utmost, but a patient will still pass on. You know, you know. And you realize also that you are, in a way, um, sometimes helpless, you know, but not hopeless. You know, right? And so you have to convey the right message in the teaching program. That's why the training program is very important, and they are trying to introduce more into the curriculum on this subject, on death and dying. And what can we say or what we shouldn't say? Sometimes the doctor will say, well, you have just uh, three months more to live. And that's fatal because the patient will live to four months and they'll laugh at you. And they'll say you're a lousy doctor. You know? So I think these are the issues that we often have to discuss and, and grapple with more issues as it comes along. The uh, life expectancy increases. You are seeing people who are living up to 90 or still healthy and it costs, and, and then, what happened? How do we break this news to them? But it's more important that doctors themselves understand their own mortality. That so sometimes in a group meeting we ask the young medical students, you know, have you thought about a time when you will pass on? You know, you know, where your death will come to you, and how do you prepare that? You know, or if your parents are old. You know, what do you think of of uh, looking after someone who is dying? You know? And in, invariably, not many people will tell me that. Okay, uh, Prof, I would like to. Uh, be trained in palliative care. No, no, no. no. I see you want to become a surgeon. I want to take off all this organs and chin transplant. Gradually, I understand that there are few students after graduation who are you know, exposed to the right uh, group of, of physicians in palliative medicine who are keen to carry on this, this profession. I think it's very, very important you know, because the emphasis is still on curative medicine rather than palliative medicine. At one time, the life expectancy of Singapore, of Singapore is only about 65, you know. But now we are about 84, you know. And uh, the life expectancy in Singapore is even better than North America, which is about 79, or England, 82. So firstly, we must be very thankful that the health system is good and we are taking care. You know. But with longevity, with this, this longer age of life, there will be a time this, that will come to an end. And how much can we help the people at the health scene. You know. So once again, in the training program, there is, they're, they're introducing this subject on death and dying to help the nurses understand how to explain it to the uh, patients and also the family caregivers. This sounds a very morbid subject, you know, but it's once again how to craft it in a way, you know, and, and also a sense of hope in them that you can help them even the last few days of their life, you know, the sense of uh, even celebration of life. Palliative care is now being introduced in almost all the hospitals here in Singapore, which is excellent. Although it's always difficult to get people to work in this area, you know, I think, but those who are in it are very, very committed. You know. Palliative medicine is a, a team effort, and this is something we reinforce in people. And I have very good uh, 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 response from people with family with cancer that the palliative care team has been wonderful in helping to, because they all, they all look after the, the patient, they also help the caregivers, the, provide them psychological support, which is very important to, for caring.